We are live. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to iFocus Online Lecture 193 and the Regina Session 45. And today we have with us Dr. Arindam Chakravarti, sir, from Center for Site, New Delhi. And he'll be talking on photic retinal injuries, mechanisms, prevention, and management. Uh, Dr. Chakravarti has done his MBBS from Guwahati and uh, MS Aftal in Agra SN Medical College. And he did his long term fellowship training in VR uh, at Shankar Nizala, Chennai. And he has been a part of Center for Site, New Delhi, Retina, Retina, and UVR for the past 10 years. And he's a member of various societies and he has a keen interest in academics and research. So, welcome to you, sir. And I won't, uh, uh, yes, sir, I won't make you wait. Kindly go ahead. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Santosh, sir, and uh, Dr. Lalit Verma, sir, for giving me this opportunity to present in this uh, uh, iFocus, which is a prestigious uh, program for uh, teaching uh, postgraduates and fellows going on for since quite a few years all across the country. So I won't, I won't take much time. I'll share the screen with you all. So I hope my presentation is visible. Yes. I'm going in slideshow mode. Uh, so I'll be speaking today on uh, photic retinal injuries, uh, mechanisms, prevention, and management. I will start with a case. I will start as a patient who came to me in the OPD. She was a 66 years old lady with a history of viewing a solar eclipse. The right eye was pseudophagic with best corrected visual equity of 6.9. And the left eye, had cataract, you can make out from the hazy view of the fundus. And the vision was uh, best corrected, visual equity was uh, 636. Uh, intricate uh, view examination of the fundus could uh, reveal some uh, RP mottling in the right eye in the macula. The left macula was not very well visible. Uh, what we did, we decided to go ahead with a, a OCT because when we saw the lady clinically, we felt there were some RP changes in the left uh, macula also. So on doing the OCT, we see some very minute changes in the right eye. Here you can see at the level of the pointer, there is a break in the RPCC complex, just subfovially in the right eye. This is something which we call a small outer lamellar defect, subfovially. The left eye has a altered foveal contour and the breach here in the RPCC complex and over the outer layers of the retina, the breach is much more, you can see it's parafoveal and it is right next to the fovea. It's a significant uh, parafoveal outer lamellar defect. And these are, as you know, these are the, this is the area where the photoreceptors are concentrated. So clinically, we couldn't really elicit much of uh, changes, but on doing the OCT, uh, the left eye showed significant changes uh, in the OCT, uh, which clearly uh, tells us that the patient has a guarded visual potential. And uh, she's due for cataract, as you can see from the haze in the left eye, the media haze. Now, uh, although I have mentioned that the patient has a history of viewing solar eclipse, before doing the OCT, I had not asked that history. Only after view, viewing the OCT, I asked the lady whether she had ever viewed a solar eclipse or whether she had been exposed to any uh, welding lights or uh, any other unusual uh, experience, any, anything similar to that. And then she revealed that she had a history of viewing solar eclipse many, many years back. So you can imagine, uh, like we do a cataract surgery in this lady without doing an OCT. We don't know that she has a, this subtle changes right at the visual center, right at the level of the fovea. And she comes with a poor post-operative vision and you can't, and you have to explain it to her all over again that, uh, so this is why a preoperative OCT is so important 
these days before a cataract surgery, this particular case illustrates. Now we already know before the surgery that our visual potential is guarded. So this is just an uh, introduction about uh, photic retinopathy, what the things that can that can that we can come across in a very subtle kind of a way because you don't suspect them initially when you see the patient, but once you do these investigations, things become clearer. So what is photic retinopathy? So it's an umbrella term that encompasses retinal damage from light of varying sources and wavelengths, ranging from infrared to ultraviolet. The reports of photic retinopathy date back to the biblical ages when St. Paul was temporarily blinded by a bright light with full recovery of vision three days later. Photic retinopathy has also con contributed to the history development of landmark uh, groundbreaking ophthalmic treatments. In 1940s, solar retinopathy would inspire Dr. Mayer Shukarat to use sunlight to apply diathermy to the retina for treating retinal detachments. This revolutionary concept gave rise to photocoagulation. So what are the types of injury we see normally? The commonest uh, is solar retinopathy, which most commonly occurs during the solar eclipse, but it can also occur during episodes of sun gazing related to psychosis, religious ceremonies, military exposure, sunbathing, outdoor sports, and even drone operations. Second cause is lasers, third is arc welding, and fourth is iatrogenic intraoperative microscope lights. So these, in a nutshell, are the common causes of Photic retinal injury. I will go to them one by one. So, what happens in solar retinopathy? Here, the damage is thought to be mediated by phototoxic reactions leading to photoreceptor and retinal pigment epithelium cell death. The patients usually present with decreased visual equity, which could be bilateral or unilateral depending on the exposure, central scotoma, and negative after image of the sun lasting several hours. The mechanisms of injury on exam, uh, the macula may have a pale yellow spot near the fovea, which may progress to a lamellar hole or a foveal depression over time. Prognosis is generally good with improvement of visual equity occurring within weeks. Those scotomas may persist. So this is a image of a patient with uh, solar retinopathy, the OCT image showing this uh, changes in the uh, retina in the focal outer uh, focal outer retinal atrophy consistent with solar uh, retinopathy right here it's a spectral domain oct and uh, same in the picture below in the other eye in the left eye there is an outer lamellar defect subfovially the fluorescent angiography is usually normal, but with chronic injury, it may reveal RP atrophy without leakage. Mostly some degree of staining will be seen in the FAZ. So what are the risk factors? One is young age. People who are young are more curious and they do things out of fun without realizing the potential implications. And of course, a young person will have a clear crystalline lens Next is lack of ocular pain while gazing at the sun. Most of us flinch. We have photophobia, but there, there may be people who have uh, a lesser photophobia on gazing at the sun. Emetropia has also been shown to be a risk factor given that light is more likely to focus precisely on the retina. Climactic uh, risk factors for solar retinopathy include bright, clear weather conditions, solar eclipse, and solar altitude greater than 60 degrees from the horizon. Next, we come to how a uh, mechanism of injury in arc welding uh, solar uh, arc, arc welding uh, photic retinopathy. So, what is arc welding? Basically, it is a process that binds metal to metal by utilizing electricity to generate uh, heat. Simultaneously, it produces significant radiation. Patients typically present after exposure to arc welding without proper filtering goggle protection. Symptoms include uh, decreased vision, bilateral central scotomas, and metamorphopsia. Exam findings and prognosis is almost similar to solar retinopathy. 
Then uh, this MTT, laser-induced retinopathy, this is not the laser we use uh, in treatment. This is the uh, pointer lasers, which are so common these days. They're, these are high-powered lasers, and they are increasingly common among children and minors due to ease of access. The patients generally present with sudden unilateral loss of vision. It can be even a less as 20 by 200 or worse after laser exposure that is occasionally accompanied by a popping noise at the time of injury. So this is again a textbook image where you see a, a big patient with the laser induced retinopathy. They may also have a visual field defect An examination may show retinal edema, a macular hole or hemorrhage which may be vitreous hemorrhage, subhyoid hemorrhage, intraretinal, or even subretinal. Of course, this patient here has a subhyoid and intraretinal hemorrhage causing back shadowing, right, at the fovea. The prognosis is, however, generally good with visual equity improving over the course of days to months. However, permanent vision loss may occur in patients with foveal involvement. What are the risk factors for laser-induced retinopathy? Several case series have suggested that it affects the male sex and pediatric population more frequently. A case series and literature review by Top, Pedersen, et al. suggests a rise in laser-induced retinopathy after 2013. Now, this is a patient which we saw in 2020, December. So he had uh, exposure to the laser toy gun and presented with a drop in vision. His vision was 6-9 in the left eye. The right eye was fine, as you can see from the OCT image. The right is a normal OCT, while the left eye, you can see this uh, lesion in the fovea, close to the fovea, which just close to the fovea. You cannot say it's involving, but in, the OCT clearly shows a subfoveal uh, uh, patho- pathological change with the retinal uh, thickening here with some cystoid changes and disruption in the outer and middle layers of the retina subfoveally. So this is the picture which the patient presented with uh, the fluorescent angiography of the left eye is shown here where there is a thin rim of uh, hyperfluorescence increasing in the late stage around the central area of hypofluorescence. It's mostly a staining, it's not a leakage. It's, as you can see, the margins are fairly well defined. So this patient uh, was treated with uh, oral steroids. We'll come to the treatment later, because it was better to do something uh, than do nothing. And uh, although, as we will see from the treatment details, uh, uh, benefit with Treatment is mostly anecdotal and we don't really know how much it helps, but still this patient was put on oral steroids in tapering doses. And uh, the vision remained uh, on the lower side uh, a week later. This is a a picture on uh, 30th of December, one week after the injury. Uh, The vision was 612, waist corrected visual acuity. Although clinically, the changes are kind of settling down, the intensity of the changes are reducing close to the fovea. The OCT is still showing this uh, thickening in the middle layers, and the subfoveal layer shows a lot of irregularities in the RPCC complex, indicating photoreceptor damage. After a year, this is 2021 February, the Injury has healed mostly. You can see the changes in the RPCC complex. There is no edema now, although there is uh, the architecture of the fovea, the middle layers especially are disrupted. The RPCC complex is completely disrupted uh, subfovially and parafovially, but the patient does maintain 6-9 vision. So this is an example of a patient which we had uh, and who thankfully did not go to severe vision loss. He maintained 6-9 vision. So next we come to uh, an important uh, cause of uh, photic 
retinopathy with iatrogenic light induced uh, maculopathy, which was described in 1983 by McDonald and Irwin, who first described iatrogenic light induced maculopathy from the operating microscope. It's classically associated with cataract extraction, but cases have also been reported from uh, coaxial microscope illumination during pterygium excision, as well as the endo illumination we use during vitrectomy. In this case, the patients are frequently asymptomatic because the damage may not be in the fovea. So they may sometimes complain of a paracentral scotoma postoperatively. Fundus examination may reveal yellow-white pigmented mottling with fluorescent angiography classically exhibiting a mottled hyperfluorescence. So uh, Setin Kaya et al. identified the following risk factors for uh, iatrogenic light-induced maculopathy. They are uh, detailed here. One is increased body temperature, increased arterial oxygen saturation, increased choroidal pigmentation, lightly pigmented ocular fundus, pre-existing maculopathy, the degree of pupillary dilatation, small refractive error, history of hydrochlorothiazide use, and coexistence of vascular diseases like hypertension and diabetes mellitus. Differing the most in presentation and diagnostic imaging, the iatrogenic microscope light-induced photic retinopathy has several distinguishing features. It is the most likely of the photic retinopathies to be non-phobia involving. A literature review by Rod et al. revealed reveal that 54 reported cases of microscope light-induced retinal injury, 28 were inferior in location and only four were phobia involving. So that is the good part about it because mostly uh, the phobia is spared in this particular type of uh, maculopathy. The fundus examination will again reveal an elliptical area with pigmented mottling and RP changes quite similar to the others. The fluorescent angiography shows an elliptical area of staining and mottled hyperfluorescence overlying an area of blockage. The OCT may show loss of the ellipsoid zone with disruption of the RP. They mostly the OCT picture looks similar in all the three uh, uh, photic maculopathies. So, uh, as, as I showed in the first uh, case, which I showed in the beginning, the history is so important uh, when you make a diagnosis of uh, photic uh, retinopathy. And many a times it is the OCT along with the fundus picture, which guides you towards the diagnosis. So you have to ask for a specific occupation his, occupational history, history of hobbies, medication history, recreational drug use also, and possibly psychiatric history among the risk factors. But then again, it is important to note that uh, in a retrospective study of solar retinopathy in, done in ne Nepal and Germany, 49% of patients could not remember that they had looked at the sun. So that again is a confounding factor. So diagnosis, the patients again may frequently be asymptomatic or they may complain of central scotoma. Like the first patient I showed, she had she never complained of any symptoms as such. It was just the OCT which told us that there may be some uh, history of uh, photic injury in the eye. So solar and arc welding retinopathy are usually, they, are, uh, they present similarly and mostly the findings are bilateral and symmetrical because you usually view the sun on, or the welding with both the eyes open if you do so. But laser induced and iatrogenic photic retinopathy are usually unilateral because usually the light is shown at one eye rather than both the eyes simultaneously and iatrogenic as the name suggests has to be unilateral. Pathogenesis, now well, electromagnetic radiation, including UV and visible light, can induce retinal damage by three mechanisms, thermal, mechanical, and photochemical. The thermal and mechanical damage are lesser contributors to retinal damage from photic retinopathy, but are the primary mechanisms of action for several ophthalmic laser treatments. Thermal damage occurs when light is absorbed by a chromophore, leading to the production of heat, protein denaturation, and cell death. It is the basis for argon krypton laser photocoagulation. Mechanical damage 
usually occurs when high energy absorption causes the rapid vaporization of water and tissue, leading to an explosive force that is transmitted to the adjacent tissues. The amount of damage is related in a non-linear fashion to the amount of energy absorbed and the rate of delivery. This type of damage occurs with uh, NDR lasers. Now, photochemical damage is thought to be the most common mechanism by which photic retinopathy causes retinal damage. Photochemical damage occurs when the photon-induced chemical reactions alter the cellular molecules, converting them into toxic byproducts of reactive oxygen species. The formation of these free radicals causes lipid peroxidation and retinal tissue damage, just as it causes anywhere else in the body. Retinal photoreceptors, particularly the outer segments, possess long membranes and thus are postulated to be especially susceptible to free radical damage. So now the treatment part is a little, uh, I mean, we really don't have any specific treatment for uh, photic retinopathy other than symptomatic uh, NSAIDs and steroids. And even there, uh, most studies have not shown any definitive benefit with this form of managements. And there are unfortunately no randomized control trials for the treatment of photic retinopathy and no therapy has been proven effective. The most cases usually resolve with observation, although few cases result in permanent but modest decrease in visual acuity with persistent scotoma or metamorphopsia. Few animal models of uh, photic retinal injury demonstrating therapeutic efficacy of corticosteroids. Evidence of efficacy in humans is just anecdotal with case reports at best. But that is the only thing which we can, one can possibly do when one comes in the acute stage with photic injury as the previous case which I presented showed. Although the patient uh, uh, did not uh, worsen in that uh, uh, he maintained 6.9, but uh, he couldn't recover to 6.6 also. But it is hypothesized that treatment with corticosteroids in theory reduces the cellular inflammatory response from laser injury. Now, there could be more severe clinical presentations, particularly with laser-induced retinopathy, which may require surgical intervention like non-resolving full thickness macular holes from retinal laser injury may require parse planar vitrectomy with membrane peeling for and gas injection for improvement in vision. Pre-retinal, intraretinal, and subretinal hemorrhages typically resolve with observation. Uncommonly, laser-induced retinopathy may lead to CNVM formation if the laser causes a break in the Brooks membrane. So this generally happens if you apply the laser spot at the same location repeatedly and you use high intensity burns, then that can induce a break in Brooks membrane and lead to a CNVM. And here, of course, we need intravitreal anti-VEGFs. What about the prognosis? Overall, the prognosis for photic retinopathy is good. In a study following 319 patients with solar retinopathy in Nepal and Germany, 80.9% of the affected eyes had a visual equity of 612 or better. Regarding arc welding retinopathy, a retrospective analysis by Zhang et al. showed patients with presenting BCVA of uh, Snell and equivalent 20 by 25 to 20 by 100 improved to a final BCVA of 20 by 25 to 20 by 66 over an average of one to four months. Non-foveal retinal damage typically portends excellent prognosis and the patients are frequently asymptomatic. Although laser-induced retinopathy can manifest with more severe clinical signs like macular hole and hemorrhages, prognosis is generally good for these patients as well. In the case series by Dennis et al., six out of seven patients recovered to BCV of 20 by 40 or better even in this laser-induced uh, maculopathy. Another multicenter case series showed that high-powered lasers greater than 5 milliwatts are significantly associated with worse visual recovery, with only 5 out of 36 making full recovery, 
and 31 out of 36 having lasting symptoms. So a disease which is not, which cannot be treated effectively is best tackled by preventive strategies because given the lack of effective treatments for photic retinopathy, education, prevention, and protection are all of uh, great importance. The American Academy uh, recommends protection with sunglasses that block 99% or 100% of UVA and UVB light. This is mostly recommended for aviators and Air Force pilots. And the government should provide adequate public health information, educating the public that an eclipse is not safe to view with the, with the naked eye. The safest and cheapest method involves a pinhole system with a screen 50 centimeter behind its opening. Alternatively, silver, aluminum, or chromium may be embedded in films to attenuate ultraviolet rays, visible and infrared energy. In addition, arc welders, glass numbers 12 and 14, aluminized mylar are safe filters for eclipse viewing. Regarding iatrogenic microscope light-induced photic retinopathy, Huargetal found that the most significant and also most modifiable risk factor is prolonged duration of surgery. Recommendation to perform surgeries safely and efficiently, avoiding prolonged oper operating times if possible, is the one of the easiest ways to prevent uh, iatrogenic uh, uh, photic maculopathy. And with the operating microscope, surgeons may use ultraviolet filters and opaque filters when applicable. For arc welders protection, the US Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration advises goggles or headgear with the appropriate minimum protective shade number, depending on what arc current is being used. Parents should specifically avoid giving children laser pointers, given the high risk and prevalence of laser-induced retinopathy in this population. So that in a nutshell completes uh, this presentation, which is uh, mostly a dry topic. And the worst part is we generally, most of the patients who are diagnosed with photic maculopathy have a very unreliable uh, history. Many of them, uh, although they have subfovial outer lamellar defects, they don't, they deny history of uh, we all, they either deny or they have forgotten. They don't, they don't remember that they have ever viewed any welding light. Solar uh, maculopathy is more common in the older age group because uh, though maybe the knowledge levels were not that high in the past when people did not know that viewing a solar eclipse could lead to cochlear damage. But preventive strategies are of uh, primary importance, especially in the laser pointers, which are nowadays being widely used among children, especially as toys. So those can easily be prevented with proper counseling and uh, especially the, during, before a solar eclipse, the government should specify, they do, the, the government always does the same. They advise, uh, especially our government, they, they, they've always come out with uh, guidelines avoid asking people to avoid uh, injuries to the eye during a solar eclipse. And uh, we accepting questions, if any. Thank you so much sir, for covering such a such an important topic. Actually, for daily use itself, and as well as for the postgraduate purpose, this is a quite an important topic. And that's why yes. we even have a lot of questions coming up on this topic from the viewers. Um, right. Would you like me to take them one by one, sir. I'll, I'll stop sharing first, ma'am. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll just stop sharing. Yes. Sir. Yes, sir. There's a question on uh, Facebook that would be that uh, can coaxial illumination or endo illumination cause photic injury and how would we like to protect it, prevent it. Yes, uh, the the easiest way out is to have a, a 
you have to don't prolong the surgery to the extent possible that is the best possible way and not to focus uh, the light right at the fovea you should try to avoid focusing light when you are using the endo illuminator but you do need to do the uh, focusing right at the macula during a macular hole surgery or a erm removal but then you have to be careful in finishing the steps as quickly as possible that needs a lot of expertise for a beginner it may take it will definitely take a longer time so basically the main way out of this is to reduce the operating time because the longer you are exposed to the light the longer is the the higher is the chances of a photic injury so the only possible way out is to reduce the duration of the surgery to the extent possible there is no other way for that many a times even after a macular hole surgery the vision doesn't improve uh, there could be a lot of other causes also which mean which like the dye itself can the dye we use for ilm staining that itself can cause macular toxicity if you directly inject on the fovea you should not inject on the fovea you should inject below the fovea or above the fovea but uh, suppose a patient doesn't uh, improve post macular surgery because if you in the other uh, retinal surgeries you generally do not like for a vitreous hemorrhage or a retinal detachment you are not focusing the endoluminate on the macula you are focusing at other locations uh, you are doing a peripheral vitreotomy but mainly in the macular hole surgery or a erm surgery you have to work in the macula itself so there you have to be very careful right so main main is the uh, d- duration don't keep on fiddling in the macula if you've done your job get out of the area you have peeled the membrane don't keep on peeling just finish the job quick and right uh, i mean the for post graduates i think it should be kept in mind specifically even for cataract yes, surgery yes. is that yes yes because it yeah. takes time for, for a beginner surgeries do take time so you have to be cautious on that there is another question uh, along with that question for post graduates one of the post graduates have asked that uh, uh, so while doing cataract surgeries is there any role of viscoelastics in preventing photic injury uh yeah it uh, i have not uh, come across uh, any such study uh, if anybody has come across any case report or case series as such that viscoelastic yeah it's a medium which will definitely uh, in addition to protecting the cornea corneal endothelium it will definitely impede the light to some extent from in uh, view uh, uh, involving the retina but i have not uh, really come across any case report detail uh, or any study which has mentioned about uh, viscoelastics protecting from uh, photic injury of the retina okay so but theoretically yes it is possible but uh, how much it is actually uh, how much it works out is difficult to say because the main purpose you are doing it is to protect the cornea and uh, the higher chances of a photic injury is mostly in, during surgeries mostly in vitreo retinal surgeries right. you can ask her him or her whether if there is any case report it is it's interesting it's a new new thing I, even for me uh, this coelastic if, if there is any such case report I'd like uh, i'd request uh, the person to share it with us sure sir uh so do you think that photic injury has any increased preponderance in cases where there is an underlying uh, retinopathy that is like diabetes diabetes or hypertension it, that, that's what one of the studies which i just showed it mentions that there is a higher chance of uh, photic uh, retinopathy in uh, patients with vascular diseases like diabetes and hypertension which has been studied and has been found to be true so yes in a diabetic or a hypertensive and patients with those particular type of diuretics which i mentioned hydrochlorothiazide they are more at risk definitely right so and specifically so in solar retinopathy cases will it always be bilateral like we can't say that for the iatrogenic ones or very uh, it would be quite unusual for a person to view a solar eclipse with one eye closed so that's <laughs> one of the differentiating points so most likely mm-hmm. the person will see with both the eyes open yeah although mm-hmm. if if he, there's a possibility if there is a lot of photophobia one eye may close more than the other and maybe there could be some 
uh, well, it's possible. Theory, again, it's theoretically possible that a person with solar retinopathy may have it just in one eye, uh, but you would expect it to happen in both the eyes. That's what one. That's one of the points I mentioned. The, one of the different points, like solar uh, and arc welding retinopathy, they are usually bilateral, whereas iatrogenic, because you are doing surgery in one eye, that's right, usually sir. unilateral. Right, sir. Uh, so you have mentioned the role of corticosteroids in uh, uh, in photic injuries. As I as I said, <laughs> there is no proven benefit. Like suppose many many times when the patient comes with uh, clinical practice is many a times different from uh, what the books teach us, or the books and the evidence does not show much of an evidence of benefit with corticosteroids. This has been, uh, uh, but when a patient comes to you with an acute injury and you know there is uh, the OCT shows uh, uh, retinal edema, intraretinal edema, and uh, changes in the RPCC complex, though at least it will not cause any harm. Corticosteroids will at least reduce some amount of the inflammatory response. So it's, uh, it's a good idea to give corticosteroids when it's a fovea involving injury. At least Thank it will. Whatever visual potential the patient has, at least that much it will maintain. So, if, if the patient comes with an acute injury involving the fovea, yeah, it's better to give corticosteroids. Right. And similarly, so what about the role of anti VEGF in these cases? Uh, anti VEGF has a very specific indication only if you have a CNVM. That's uh, not, not for. Uh, for any, uh, I think steroids has a, is a better anti-inflammatory uh, drug for this condition rather than anti-VEGFs because uh, anti-VEGFs, yeah, if you develop a CNVM due to photic injury, as I mentioned, uh, if you apply high intensity laser, even in doing a focal laser, and you breach the Brooks membrane, then you may create neovascularization. In that case, yes, anti-VEGFs, but just photic injury with no CNVM, I think steroids are a better choice. Okay, so that's uh, the, we have a connective question to that. That is that uh, how do you differentiate between a CIMVM due to photic injury and even AMD? You have to look at, uh, see if there is uh, associated uh, drusen and uh, the for number one, of course, the history of laser. So if you have a history of laser, and there is uh, no other feature like patient is neither a high myope. You, you have to rule out the other CNVMs, like you have to rule out age-related ARMD-related CNVM. If it's a ARMD-related CNVM, you will definitely see drusen in the other eye. And even in the eye where the CNVM is developed, it doesn't happen in isolation. That will be soft drusen or PEDs, drusenoid PEDs. So that rules out ARMD. If there is no drusen in either eye, then you have to think of the other things is of myopic CNVM. Though if the, there is a myopic CNVM, you will know that the, the, this will be a myopic eye. All the other features of uh, myopic fundus will be there. Then next comes inflammatory CNVM. Inflammatory, you will uh, see evidence of old choroiditis. So what else? Like trauma-induced CNVMs are also there. And CNVMs can also arise out of uh, osteomas, choroidal osteomas. So NGOH streaks. So you will see associated uh, findings of the other diseases which we are talking about. In If it is a laser-induced CNVM, mostly you will have a history of laser. Laser, why was it done? Was it done for, uh, I mean, sometimes even uh, a therapeutic, uh, you have treated a focal leak, focal CSR leak with laser, for example. Even that can lead to a CNVM if you've used very high intensity burns. So history of laser and the associated findings are the main features. You will have uh, the other uh, findings in the other causes. Okay, so there are very two interesting questions, which are the environmental components. So one question is that, right. uh, do you think that there is any difference in the incidence in areas where there is ozone hole component? Quite likely, quite likely. As you can see, some of the studies were done in uh, Nepal, uh, high altitude mm -hmm. areas. Yes. So there, there is a higher incidence of solar retinopathy and climatic factors. Yeah, they do have a role. Like uh, I, you are right about that. So atmospheric conditions, climatic factors, they do have a role in solar retinopathy. Like if you have a clear sun and uh, one, one was about the horizon, the sixty degree thing, which they mentioned in one of the 
which I mentioned in one of the slides. So yes, definitely high altitudes again, you are uh, more likely to possibly have this kind of changes. And more towards the equator, sir. Will that also make a difference? Like the continents that are closer to the equator will have higher chances of photic injuries. Does that also? Yeah, the sun is directly over it. Sun is directly over it there. So yes, definitely more intense sun rays. At, uh, uh, ozone depletion is more in the polar regions, I think, isn't it? Uh, North Pole, True, South sir. Pole, the ozone depletion, depletion is more compared to the equator. So in the equator, the cause will be the directly over at sun and the higher intensity of the rays. Maybe. But okay, then again, the, the, it will be more difficult to view the sun in the equator than in the uh, <laughs> temperate zones, I guess, because uh, the intensity of the sun rays will be such in the equator that people will flinch more, more photophobia. Definitely so. Uh, so uh, there's an, uh, there are two questions about macular hole actually. So can photic injuries cause macular hole? Yes, it can cause. Definitely, it can cause in rare, rarely, not very common, but yes, it can cause macular hole. And then uh, you have to see uh, the nature of the hole and then decide if it's a full thickness hole. Vision has dropped uh, significantly, and uh, of course, you have to go for vitreoretinal surgery. But there, uh, there are instances where uh, these holes can self-close also. There are instances where macular holes, especially due to trauma, can close on their own. So you have to take a clinical decision based on the uh, symptoms and the clinical picture. Right. So, so what will be the visual prognosis in uh, such patients? Because it's not... As I say the visual prognosis is usually good. It's usually not very bad. Although... Well, many people are not aware, only during a routine checkup, they find that they are reading 612 or 69 or something like that. And mm -hmm. then you do see those subtle changes in the fovea, those RP mottling or whatever. And then you do an OCT and then you see those, uh, especially those outer lamellar defects, which are classical, like the area which I showed in the OCTs. So they are mostly in the outer layers of the retina, subfovially, parafovially. As the first case which I showed, it was just out of the blue. We did not expect to get anything. We just felt uh, the, the, the view itself of the fundus was pretty hazy in that, in that left eye. But since the right eye had RP modeling, the left eye, we felt there was something not uh, very normal about this fovea. So we did an OCT and out of that we see a significant uh, outer level of defect, a fair, a big one in the left eye. And then retrospectively, we asked the history, did you ever see a solar eclipse? And she says, yes, I did see without uh, any protection. So it's quite clear. That, so even then, this patient, she's 636, mostly post-cataract surgery. She should improve to around 612, 69, but 66 is unlikely. Okay, sir. Yeah. So, so how would we differentiate between the macular holes caused by photic injuries and the idiopathic ones? And since the idiopathic ones will have a graver prognosis, will anything change? See, number one, the it's a very rare complication. Photic macular holes are very rare. And uh, again, you have to uh, look at the appearance of the hole. The idiopathic macular hole has a classical appearance. It has those typical four stages. The, this uh, photic injury holes may uh, appear more like traumatic holes. The appearance, uh, traumatic holes, you know, the, it, they have an appearance where the two walls of the holes may not be even, they may be uneven. And those, uh, the usual evolution of a senile macular hole, you see the, without PVD, then PVD induces partial thickness. Then, then the stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. But those you don't see in a, this kind of a photic uh, macular holes. And they are more common with the lasers rather than solar solar in solar retinopathy and arc welding uh, is not a very common cause of a macular hole. More common with the this uh, children the lasers which they use. So if you look at the difference between a traumatic macular hole and the idiopathic senile macular hole, this photic macular holes will look more like a traumatic macular hole rather than a senile macular hole. 
Right, sir. So in cases which are operated, um, uh, like for the macular hole cases which are operated after photic injury, how often would you call them for the follow-up and uh, like, you know, till how, after how many months do they settle down usually? Photic, uh, macular hole due to photic injury, we yes, mean sir. to say. Yes. Sir. If we operate, if you operate, and it's the same. See, basically, when you operate a macular hole, basic thing is, the initial, the steps which you do are routine. Same, you induce a PVD if there is no PVD and you peel the ILM. The size of the peel varies from person to person, but you use a dye, you mostly use brilliant blue. So after that, you inject gas. So nowadays, most of the studies, they say that strict prone position for 48 hours, 48 hours, absolutely strict prone position. And most of these holes close, which have to close. These are the straightforward ones, the smaller holes, the fresh holes. The older holes, of course, you do a lot of other stuff like you uh, do inverse ILM peeling and inverse. those holes mostly have a secondary closure rather than a primary closure. But for the fresh holes, which you operate, the initial 48 hours are the most significant. Normally, we are surgery patients, you put gas, the gas absorbs in six, uh, six weeks. So till six weeks, you have to follow up the patient and make sure there is no pressure rise, IOP rise. At least twice a week, you follow up the patient. Make sure it doesn't go to high altitudes with the gas because that will lead to a spike in IOP. So, but the main uh, hole closure period, if it is a one of those fresh macular holes, the smaller holes, is for usually nowadays we consider it 48 hours. So we advise strict prone positioning for 48 hours. After that, we do the OCT as the gas moves up. So you can do an OCT. So by one week, we, we get to know whether the hole is closed or not. If the hole is closed, the rest of the monitoring is basically make sure that the uh, tapering of eye drops and so that there is no infection or other complications or like ret retinal detachment or anything. But yeah, such patients do need to be followed up every three months for at least a year after the initial six weeks. Okay, sir. So there's another question about uh, the cases developing the solar uh, uh, solar injury in the initial phase. Like the vision are just like uh, they've just lost like two lines or or so. How would you like to follow them up, and what investigations would you like to do for these patients? Like, would you like to do a, a regular OCT, or how would you like to follow up, and what complications are you looking at? That's what means. Uh... You don't really, uh, I mean, if the extent of severity is usually manifested in the presentation itself. So if there is, uh, mostly the self-resolve. So main thing is you don't really go in, go in and intervene in such patients. See, if the patient has come, and they usually, mostly they come with solar retinopathy, most of, most of the patients I've seen have come with old history. So it's already done. Nowadays, nobody, it's very rare that somebody will come with a solar, solar maculopathy. More likely, an acute presentation will come from a uh, viewing a welding welding light or that laser, yeah. laser injury. Even the iatrogenic injuries, very few I have seen. I mean, iatrogenic laser inju induced injuries, very few I have seen. Mostly you will see welding light uh, injuries and the pointer, the child, the ones which children use, the pointers, the laser pointers, the laser guns. So in those cases, most of the manifestations are uh, there with the, when the patient, patient is presenting. As time goes by, you will only see an improving picture. Rarely does it go to a deteriorating picture. It's very uncommon that uh, if the patient has a macular hole, it will mostly manifest in the beginning itself. It will not very rare for it to develop at a later stage. So okay, uh, follow the patient initially, at least for a month, do a weekly follow-up. Um, at least give him, uh, if it's acute injury, at least oral steroids, topical steroids, topical NSAIDs. That much you give, follow on a weekly basis. After a month, if there is, mostly they improve within a month to one, one to four months, they usually improve. So after, after a month, you call them on a monthly basis for uh, till about four months. And then that's the maximum. That's the thing. You don't have too much of treatment options here. So that's why prevention is better. You don't really, 
can do much if there is any even any vision deficit and some of these patients do stabilize around 69 they don't go back to 66 right so so uh, another question is that is it always a uh, foveal or uh, parafoveal no, it doesn't. It's not always foveal. It could be parafoveal also. Like the first picture, uh, first patient again, if you remember, the right eye was subfoveal, but the vision was 6-9 mm -hmm. and she was not complaining of anything. The left eye, which had cataract, was parafoveal. Yeah, right, and even there, she was she had 636 vision. So parafoveal, outer lamellar defects, uh, you expect a better vision actually than the one the, than the right eye. So it it could be, but uh, most many most of the patients do have subfoveal changes. Do have subfoveal changes. Right. So so the last question would be about the counselling of the patient, sir. Like I'm sure that it takes a lot to convince them. I or, trust uh, them. Yeah, many yeah. if they're, especially if it's a young patient, they have a lot of questions. They feel they say, when will we be? Will we ever become normal? Or, if yeah. symptoms mostly will be blurry confusion and some degree of metamorphosis. Yeah. They will say some of the letters will be cut, cut with this when they, they are asked to view these nails. They will say some of the letters appear cut. To counsel them that that it's a good thing that you have maintained this much vision, it will you'll have to accept this that this is not going to get normal. So since you have to tell them that uh, you have to tell the positive side that it could have been much worse, but at least. But most of the, that is what most of the patients we do see, they're not uh, mostly 612, below 612, 618 is uncommon. Mostly there's 69, 612 range, but some of them are, are symptomatic. You have to counsel them that they are not going to harm you. You have to live with it and uh, they're not going to worsen. They usually don't worsen. They're stable. That's what you have to tell them. That these are stable issues. This happened because you viewed this thing. Now it cannot reverse back to normal, so but it won't go worse. Also, that much you have to tell them. Right. So, uh, so that is a very important uh, like pointer that you have told because it's very important to counsel these patients as they are not very going important. to get. Yeah. The young patients, Correction especially, is. they have a lot of questions. Yeah. True. True, sir. Thank you so much sir, for covering such an important topic for all of us, for postgraduates and even as ophthalmologists, because this is a topic which is uh, all pan, spe uh, pan speciality. So it's something that we all have to take care of. Hope I could do justice to the topic. <laughs> you did, definitely did, and you answered all the questions duly. So thank you so much for taking out your time, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank Good you night. viewers for being here and we'll see you next on April 8th. That is posterior segment trauma by Dr. Mahesh Anmugam. So see you all for the next session. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night. Good night.